at our 10 a.m. So, Andrea, I uh, I think we'll uh, kick off with our session. So, welcome everyone, and welcome to our monthly safety update. We just try in a bright and breezy, light-hearted way give you an update on the safety news over the recent weeks, uh, and we pick up the highlights out of our last newsletter. Not everyone has time to uh, to read the newsletter or uh, they like to hear a, a different way of, of uh, how we explain that. So uh, Andrea and I welcome once again Andrea joining me this morning. Uh, we're going Thanks, to take Mary. you through. Good the, morning. Yeah, going to take you through the news. Um, so the key things we'll we'll pick up on this morning. Uh, question of the week. In fact, we have two questions. Um, our topic in our last newsletter was good safety but bad process. So I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes. You've probably already read it. Um, but you might like the explanation and maybe a bit of background where the article came from that I've drafted there. Uh, Andrew will pick up on a couple of things like the Engi uh, Safety Institute's approach to engineered stone, uh, DG manifest, uh, road safety, and a couple of other points that Andrew will uh, take us through uh, it shortly. Um, and we'll finish off with the, the answers to questions of the week. So let's have it. Let's have before we get into the questions, though, um, I just wanted to touch on an article you may have seen either in the media uh, or highlighted through your various uh, safety update service. Uh, uh, there was a dramatic headline, uh, Queensland Health and Safety or Work Health and Safety uh, Risk Manager Prosecuted Because of a Lack of Risk Assessment. And this piqued my interest and uh, so uh, I, I've sought out the details of this case and, and I thought you might find it interesting because our last month, our feature topic was risk assessments. And Andrea, you, you reminded me as we were just chatting before that this surprised you as well because how can you be prosecuted for a lack of risk assessment if there's no legal requirement to actually have done a risk assessment specifically in this case? Indeed. Yeah. So. I thought I'd just give you a quick bit of background to this and maybe our view to this particular legal case. Um, this is, comes out of the Queensland Museum where two taxidermists uh, contracted Q fever. And then under further investigation by WorkSafe in Queensland, they determined that one of the ladies most likely contracted the Q fever away from the workplace. So probably out on a farm or something of that nature in direct contact with, with animals. So Q fever is a, uh, a disease which we contract zoonoses that we get from animals. So they then concluded, ah, but the second case that occurred in the museum in the taxidermy department uh, most likely happened and arose out of work. So where they're uh, preparing uh, live animals and specimens uh, for display in, in the uh, museum. And as you've already heard in the headline uh, for, for this case in the media, was that the WHS risk manager was prosecuted and the, the, the words were uh, over a three or four year period of a role in, in a time in the role as risk manager, she failed to complete a risk assessment on Q fever. And Prima facie, that would sound somewhat negligent, you would think, if there's a, a real recognised risk and the person didn't do it. Apparently, the risk manager, and this is uh, at the time, Maria Thornton, um, had been made aware of the risk, albeit very low risk. Notwithstanding that, no interest in the business from the museum, the board or the executive or the managers uh, went and attended a course and a seminar uh, to understand a bit more about Q fever and how it's contracted and what would be the controls and the defences. Um, and it was also recorded. This is the interesting thing I thought. This is the first known case of Q fever being contracted in the taxidermy industry. So it could hardly be described as highly likely or, or well known in the taxidermy industry. And so when this um, person contracted Q fever, suspected only to have occurred at work, but let's assume that that's the case. Interestingly, WorkSafe in Queensland chose to only prosecute this uh, risk manager 
none of them are the managers of the business, not the uh, business as a whole or, or any of the board. So um, even the magistrate commented on the unusual position that they've taken here. And um, so I just, Andrea said to me, so Gary, you're telling me this, what's the point for our, um, our viewers and, and, and uh, readers of our monthly newsletter? Um, so remember our last focus was on, uh, last month was on risk assessments. Um, so clearly we would still like a risk assessment on this subject. Um, you actually look at your key risks register and if it is particularly on your key, has been identified as one of your key risks of your business, you would definitely want your business to have completed a risk assessment so you properly understand it and populate your key risk register with your controls. I've pointed out this seemed to be not a high likelihood of occurrence. Uh, nevertheless, this person attempted over a period of time to advance policy and procedures and precautions in this area, but did not complete it. Um, so Andrea, I, I think my answer to you is, so what's the lesson out of this? I, I actually believe the good lawyers that we work with here in Victoria and know quite well, you and I know one in particular, um, would not have pleaded guilty to this. And I believe it would have been, and this is a, as a non-lawyer, based on the circumstances that I have read, I believe this would have been a highly defensible uh, case. And even the magistrate, and I'll just uh, point out what the magistrate said in conclusion, this was an exceptional case. And instead of issuing a hefty fine, which was sought by the prosecution, um, the risk manager in this case was only given a good behaviour bond and no conviction recorded. So you can see here, even the magistrate was somewht unimpressed uh, by uh, WorkSafe's uh, pressing and prosecution for a hefty fine for this person. So I, I think, I'll come back, Andrew, I, I think there, if you have a circumstance like this, either talk to us, we're not lawyers, but talk to us, good safety uh, independent professionals about the circumstances of your case and a good lawyer. And if anybody's ever saying who is a good lawyer out there, we can only, uh, we can only tell you the people we've used and we've had good success with. And so we'd be happy to do that. So that's just uh, before we kick off. So let's have a look at, at uh, question of the week. And um, based on a couple of things I've been dealing with just in, in uh, recent times, I thought I'd share with you. So somebody said to me, how close are pedestrians allowed to approach mobile plant? So what do the regulations tell us? So we know you're not allowed to uh, run over pedestrians. Um, that's a breach of the law. Uh, and you clearly you haven't had good traffic management and uh, traffic management and plant risk assessments and controls if you if your mobile plant in particular forklifts are probably the most common uh, mobile plant of concern but there are others uh, so how close so you know you're not allowed to run over people and collide so the the question is so tell me how close am I allowed to get or how far away do I have to maintain uh, my staff. So think about this now, um, viewers, and we'll come back to this at the end of uh, today's session. And my, I've got a similar question. Um, so a, a second question today. Similarly, how close are workers allowed to approach an unprotected edge, e.g. a roof with a fall risk greater than two metres? Um, so we know people are not allowed to be too close to the edge without handrails or harness. That's nice to know that you're not allowed to be too close, but you and I need answers and your managers need to be told, well, how close are, am I allowed to approach that unprotected edge? Or indeed, do I just go on the roof? Do I have to have a harness in any of it, no matter how close I come to the roof edge? We'll come back to the answers at the end of uh, this morning's session. So our main topic uh, uh, in our newsletter this month is good safety but bad process and Andrew you may recall I, I've been through a number of um, uh, Sydney Decker's uh, books on on accident investigations and and human error and uh, and I think you've also been through a number of these as well Andrew. yeah good good books and a good guy Sydney Decker yes indeed and maybe it's my 
my sense of humor, but I really want to help people in this area. So we, so how can we better understand accident investigation, incident investigation? And so I, I, I've just tried to provide a brief summary uh, in the last newsletter. And my, my, my questions posed it, do you generally achieve good outcomes in your business, even though you know your processes are far from ideal? There's the question. And the chances are, like most businesses, we know we don't have the best or perfect safety procedures, safety policies, and um, and, and even uh, risk assessments and everything else that goes with it. And so if you do achieve pretty good results, but you know your systems are far from ideal, the chances are you're relying fairly heavily on your own workers to adapt and be flexible given the, the gaps in your system. And I can tell you that most workers are very good and most workers are flexible and will adapt and will try and assist you and your business, even though you don't have perfect systems. So this, is, I think, is a starting point to understand um, when now when an incident happens, how quick are we to blame those very same workers who have actually been working with those gaps, being flexible, um, trying to fit in and around, uh, ah, the machinery breaks down, it's, it doesn't run perfectly, I have to keep doing running adjustments, um, I have to keep doing other things. So this is this um, realisation that um, when we do acts investigations, often the person closest to the incident is blamed. And um, bear with me if I'm smiling because I actually, when I read this in um, in in the uh, in the book, bear with me. I, I've I've got it there, um, which is the book entitled "Behind Human Error" uh, by a variety of authors, but Sydney Decker was one of those. Um, I just smiled because this just comes so real to me. Um, if you've ever been standing next to something that fell over, and somebody said, "Did you push that? Did you bump that?" Um, and we find that in a factory, if a machine jams, they will actually immediately look to the operator. What did you do wrong? What did you do? And so there's this concept. So just bear in mind, keep this in your mind. We tend to blame the person closest to the accident. This is the starting point for a lot of a lot of people immediately. What did you do? What did you touch? Why did you do that? And the worker was probably doing normal work. The same work they've been doing day in, day out for weeks, months, possibly years. But today something else went wrong and they may or may not have contributed directly to that, uh, whatever that thing that happened. So the, the book also points out that how, how we approach this has a lot of cultural uh, and hindsight bias. So once the accidents happened, hindsight biases, you can work backwards immediately to whoever was involved, and therefore you can find somebody that you believe has contributed to this. Um, the other one is, and Andrew, you may recall as, as we did um, some work in a, in a number of countries on uh, machine guarding a few years ago, we found that in countries like um, either Japan and, and uh, Germany and Switzerland in particular, have a much culturally a much higher um, emphasis on worker behaviour and uh, following the rules than we have in Australia, where we impose most of the safety duties on the employer. I, I don't know if you remember, Andrew, there was one um, where we stepped over a line, there was a line down the production line, you weren't meant to step right, over I it. I think it was 1.5 metres from the machine, and instead of guarding the machine, they actually had a a painted line and all the workers actually obeyed that as painted line and of course we got in trouble for <laughs> I can't recall if that was that. in Switzerland or Germany but they're very similar culturally I think uh, and, and obviously geographically close and so that'll work in some cultures but it doesn't work in the Australian culture and indeed the Australian safety law actually wouldn't even tolerate that so it would impose the requirement on the employer to guard that machinery not to impose a rule that people are not to cross that line uh, and touch 
the potentially dangerous machinery. So isn't this interesting? So if you were doing acts investigation, you'd have to understand what country you're in and what the culture and what the laws are and who's actually uh, responsible. Is it that the worker wasn't to touch the machine or is it something we were meant to do to guard access to that hazardous part of the machine? So I just thought I'd share a couple of those uh, things with you, which I think is is uh, rather interesting um, out of uh, this uh, month's uh, article. And um, the other thing is we tolerate a bad process if it gives us a good result. So let's assume in your business, productivity is working, most procedures are working and departments are functioning quite normally, and that's okay. But let me tell you, you've probably got, as we've mentioned earlier, not perfect systems and procedures and training, and your workers are adapting um, to these circumstances. But the moment some worker does something wrong, we're quick to criticise them. And the other one where we're not quick to criticise a worker, what if a worker breaks your rule, but it averts a, a major problem? So now a worker breaks the rule, but averted, some we're, we're likely to be praised because they've averted a disaster. But the same worker who breaks a similar rule, but now something, the machine breaks or something else goes wrong, we're very quick to blame, ah, oh, you broke our rule. So in some circumstances, we tolerate, oh, you broke the rule, but that was great because you saved us. Um, but you, another time you broke the rule, but we're not happy with that because that's, we've been inconsistent. So do we want people no, never to break the rule or do we want them or do we trust them and value the workers and the judgments they make uh, and at least be prepared to investigate why did they break the rule and under what were those circumstances? So um, I just thought I'd leave those with you. And if I may, I think I've got just a couple of points which I had there. So how do we deal with human? Here's a couple of tips that, and these are Gary Rose tips. They, they're not necessarily in order or in necessarily what uh, Sidney Decker and the other authors of Behind Human Error uh, would necessarily put forward as the top five. But let's have a look. Um, I love the statement, which was, uh, in that book, complexity is the enemy of safety, not maybe the enemy of safety. So let me tell you, every single thing that you've got in your business, procedure, policy, or checklist, which is lengthy and wordy, is the enemy of safety. You are making things worse for safety in your business. So there's no category, oh, you may be making safety worse, I just want you to understand, look, go back out after this session, look around your business, is, look at a, a document you've written on safety. If that is complex, lengthy and wordy, I'm telling you, you are the enemy of safety. So let's now start to, to and it, you might need all those words. So let's now prepare a one page summary that sits over the top. That's how you deal with it. So two understand there is an answer to every safety question. You may not know the answer, and I might, Andrew and I might not know the answer immediately, but be assured there is an answer to every safety question. And the reason we know this is every single case that gets to court, the courts can make a decision, a categoric decision about safety, whatever that issue was. So isn't that interesting? They can determine it. So how come we couldn't do that before the accident? or before the incident. So you should understand there is not a single safety question in your business that there is not a direct and clear answer to. And I actually say to, to safety friends, make sure you give your managers a clear yes, no answer to every safety question. So that's your goal now. I want you to think about this over the weekend. We're, here we are up on uh, Friday, on a Friday morning. Over the weekend, think about this, say, how can I give my uh, departmental and senior managers and supervisors clear yes no answers to every safety question so you might have to do a bit more work so so be it okay avoid giving immediate conclusions i can tell you your business will be breathing down your throat so will work safe if there's an incident occurs and they want an answer and just be um, you should resist that and be clear in your own mind that you're a good person but you need a bit more time to understand 
what's happened and why. And I've already explained to you, we're not going to jump in and just simply and quickly conclude the, um, the worker closest to the incident made a mistake. We don't know that. We don't know yet why that is. And put a focus on let's strengthen the system, not strengthen our retribution. So this is what we want to do. Strengthen the system every time an incident happens. How can we strengthen our policies, procedures, systems, activity, guarding, physical things in the workplace? And finally, we reserve punishment for deliberate and the end is, is, is linked here. Deliberate and repeated breaches or gross negligence. Essentially, the, that's the, the quick summary I, I can uh, leave with you and, and like you to pick up on just out of that uh, article. And probably at this point, um, thanks for indulging me there with that one, Andrew, because I just love that, as you know, that uh, story from Sydney Decker. Um, so, Andrew, just tell us a bit about this briefly, the Safety Institute's position on engineered stone. Yep, no worries, Gary. Um, and I did also post the link to your full article on um, good safety, bad process in the chat there, if anyone's looking at that. Thanks. thanks um, and we'll come back to your question, uh, Rick, at the end. So thanks for that. We do see. Uh, so the Australian Institute of Health and Safety have recently uh, published their position on engineered stone because there has been call, uh, calls, um, you know, from uh, health professionals to completely ban uh, processing of engineered stone. And recently, the AIHS have clarified their position to say that they do not endorse a complete ban on processing engineered stone. Um, what they have noted is, is that there are engineered stone products currently available on the market that have less than 10% of crystalline silica. And um, current research has shown that the dust emissions from processing these products and um, obviously contains less crystalline silica in, in the atmosphere, so less to be breathed in by the, the workers processing this. And um, therefore, they believe that um, instead of a complete ban, actually just uh, limiting the percentage of crystalline silica that is permitted to be in the, um, in the engineered stone to less than 10% uh, is manageable by industry and also provides better health out outcomes for the workers um, in terms of a significantly um, much lower risk of um, cancer um, or silicosis for the workers. Thank, thanks, Andrea. And I think, uh, um, if I may say, uh, a bigger topic for me, that which is one that you're our DG, Dangerous Goods Specialist in our team, is the next topic. Um, so tell us about when I need a manifest, and you've corrected one of my little bits when I drafted this slide for you. So do you want to just in, in just a summary of this so people can say, if I have these things, this is my trigger, I need a manifest? Uh, yes. So I've answered this question again in our newsletter because it's actually a frequent question that comes up and a frequent issue that I find when I visit my clients. It's actually commonly misunderstood of when they actually need to have this uh dangerous goods manifest and when they need to notify WorkSafe of their quantities. Uh, and I have mentioned, I think, in our previous webinar, I did state that, you know, these dead, dangerous goods regulations and in the other states, the WHS regulations for hazardous chemicals, it is quite difficult to understand. Um, so I'll try and simplify it for you a little bit here. And as you see on the screen there, in summary, if you exceed the quantities on the screen uh, for any of those classes of dangerous goods, uh, you would need to have a dangerous goods manifest. So that means uh, a total. So you need to add up the total of each class of dangerous goods that you have. And if any of them exceed for that particular class, the quantity that um, you see on the screen here. Uh, so, for example, um, packaging group three, packing group three of flammable liquids. If you have more than 10,000 litres of flammable liquids, so such as a large fuel tank on your site, you would need to have a manifest. Um, just for those that aren't aware, a manifest is the document uh, that details has the details about the quantities of dangerous goods on your site and emergency contact information. And we commonly store that manifest in the red box. So, um, you know, it's sometimes called an emergency information container. 
uh, and that's frequently put on the fence or another place agreed with the fire brigade. Uh, it's also worth noting that if your site does exceed manifest quantity for the dangerous goods, your site will also need to display HASCHEM placarding, which is the HASCHEM signs at the vehicle entrances and uh, placards at the storage areas. You will also need to notify your state safety regulator of your dangerous goods, sometimes called a dangerous goods license. You will need to have a specific emergency plan meeting the requirements of the legislation. And you also, and this is the one I mentioned last time, which is commonly missed, you also need to request the fire authority's advice on your um, emergency plan. Um, so if you're unsure of any of those requirements, um, feel free to give us a call at Safety Action and we can help you to understand if this is a requirement for your sites. Thanks for that, Andrea. And um, I just like this little slogan, drive so others survive. You know, um, I think there's a Formula One uh, program on Netflix, Drive to Survive, I think it's called. But this is actually emphasising not drive so you're OK, but drive so others are OK. Um, so it probably doesn't need much discussion, but thanks for uh, bringing that to our attention as well, Andrew, with Road Safety Week. Was there anything else that you got out of that? Uh, only to just remind everybody that it, the Road Safety Week is next week. Um, so if, especially if you have workers that drive for work, it's, it might be a good time to think about, you know, whether you're doing everything that you can to keep those people safe, um, you know, reducing fatigue, making sure they have the right skills and resources. Um, and, you know, um, do they have, uh, a, you know, emergency plan, place to call for help if they um, get into trouble out on the road. Terrific. Th thanks for that, Andrea. And uh, the uh, Congress that you're speaking at uh, on robotics, bear with me, I put in there one of the new rules. You know that's tongue-in-cheek uh, about very sophisticated robots that might be trying to move around in the community and disguise their identity. Uh, do you want to just briefly update that again? Uh, thanks, Gary. Um, you know, it's interesting that, you know, you, you I've seen more than once you're using these, um, you know, old sort of sci-fi references on uh, yes. robots, but, you know, it couldn't actually be more relevant today, I think, than um, in the past, you know, with all the concerns about robots and cyber security lately, um, that I think that these fears about technology and robots are actually becoming very real fears for, um, for many people. Um, so, you know, it's certainly relevant um, today. Yeah. Um, but I, what I, I think be... with artificial intelligence as well, mixing with these robots, you know, artificial intelligence is writing books and writing stories and these these robots are then going to be able to implement some of this stuff, I suspect. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, they may want to take over the factory and become the boss <laughs> themselves. So, um, you know, you these go. fears, you know, some of them are certainly event eventuating. Um, but what I'll be talking about is more on the physical safety and compliance for machinery safety. So, um, but, but I still think it's interesting and exciting. Um, the conference will be in Sydney in November, um, which is very exciting for Australia. So, you know, hopefully you can all attend. Uh, if you haven't yet registered, uh, the Congress website, I'll po post it in the chat, which is safety2023sydney.com. Uh, also, uh, safety conferences, you know, with um, COVID, uh, I guess, restrictions at least um, behind us. Uh, we also, the Australian Institute of Health and Safety Conference, uh, National Conference is in Brisbane at the end of May. Um, so check out their website for that. Um, and I also remind people, you know, that networking with your fellow safety professionals um, is really important. Um, so, you know, I um, I like to attend our local Southern Safety Group held in Dandenong. Um, so, you know, that one occurs every month in our newsletter uh, references to that. Okay, Andrea, Rick just asks, uh, do you have a link for the newsletter you mentioned? Uh, I do, and I actually posted it up um, further up a little bit in the chat, but it didn't sort of come up with a picture. So okay. if you just scroll up, further in the yeah. chat. Oh, and I think, um, oh, and Carol, thank you. Carol has posted it um, again for us. So there it is, Rick. Th thanks, Carol. And th th thanks for that, Andrea. And uh, 
um, before we get to the answers for the questions, I think Rick, uh, sorry, it also asks, based on that Queensland case that I spoke at the start of the session, what would be a recommended frequency of risk assessments? And because risk assessments, particularly in Victoria, are not prescribed at all, that's the first thing, and outside of Victoria, where they are referenced in the regs to have one, for example, uh, confined space entry, uh, diving, because Queensland has um, snorkeling, scuba diving, etc., uh, and a few other categories. It, the frequency is not prescribed. We would think update them or review uh, your key risk register and your key documents like your risk assessment annual review. Would you agree, Andrew? Just an annual um, review, just not so risk agree to assessment. It. And interesting, yeah. I was just asked this que very question yesterday. Um, yeah. Five yearly is still the rule of thumb for reviewing risk assessments, um, mainly because, especially in Victoria. We, it used to be legislated that our risk assessments for chemicals, plant and manual handling all yeah. had to be reviewed every five years. So a lot of businesses have kept that five yearly review. Um, but also remember the previous requirement used to also require a review um, if there was an incident or injury um, yeah. or if a health and safety re representative re re requested a review of your controls. Um, so I think that's still a good recommendation um, yeah. or if new information becomes available. Um, yeah. So if new information becomes available about plant equipment, about dangers, um, I think that's a good time to review your existing yeah. risk assessments. Yeah, that's a good point, Andrea. If you go back to what the law was some years ago on your DG's five yearly uh, risk assessments, that's a long time. And I would have thought too long in terms of condition of plant, equipment, storage, you could have leaking chemicals, leaking buns, all sorts of problems over a five year period. But of course, when they implement regulations, they don't want to overdo it, particularly initially. So they'll be doing something like five yearly. Um, so, so industry doesn't complain too much when they get introduced. Um, I still think good practice would be an annual review. It doesn't mean to say you redo the whole thing, but just the team that's involved in it should have a look at it and say, have we identified all of our key hazards and have we got reasonable controls for each of those hazards in place? I would have thought that's a prudent thing annually. Um, so just to come to the uh, answers to our question of the week, how close can pedestrians allowed to come to a mobile plant? One, it is not prescribed. So there is no prescribed distance. But what is quite clear is if your forklift or mobile plant runs over someone, WorkSafe will clearly allege you were too close. So now you know um, WorkSafe's job's easy. After an accident, you, so anybody struck, any accident occurs, you were too close. So you didn't, uh, you didn't make it. Um, but did you, they break a rule or was your traffic management inadequate? Rule of thumb, uh, we're starting to see, as you can see in the image here, a number of best practice companies placarding every, particularly forklifts, with the rule on the on each side of the forklift, three metres away and requiring forklift drivers to stop uh, and turn off the machine if anyone approaches within the three metre zone until they leave the zone. So the, the, that, that's the best we can give you. Rule of thumb, three metres is a good starting point for you and your business. Um, and that could be your company rule, but there is no regulation. Uh, but remember, three metres is a good way to make sure we don't uh, strike pedestrians or collisions. So there's a starting point. And the other question, how close are workers allowed to get to that roof edge if there's, uh, for example, on a roof with a, a fall risk of two metres or more in particular? Once again, that distance is not prescribed. But once again, if anyone falls off, you and obviously them are in trouble. So. Um, Rule of thumb, generally accepted within two metres of a fall of, of, a, of an edge, of an exposed edge, you should have handrails or harness, broadly speaking. So there you go. There's your rule of thumb. Anyone gets within two metres of an edge, we need uh, harness, harness or handrails. Um, but remember, sloping roofs, and I think it's Queensland in a code of practice has said the slope greater than 26 degrees, so you've got some guidance. Um, uh, may require that protection because they can tumble down the slope and be much further away from the edge um, and tumble down the slope and fall off. So you might need handrails on steeply sloping roofs uh, with any distance from the edge. 
would be prudent or harness if people are going out on the roof. So there's our um, questions of the week and our uh, best quick answer that we can give you. Thanks everyone uh, for taking the time to join us this morning. And thank you, Andrea, for explaining a number of those issues, particularly the Dangerous Goods Manifest uh, and the Safety Institute approach on, on, that, on uh, um, the uh, engineered stone as well. So thanks for that, Andrea, and thanks, thanks everyone. Gary. And we'll hopefully we'll see you next next month. Thanks. Have a good weekend, everyone. Yep. Okay. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.